thing I'll, I'll just say, uh, the final thing I'll just say is a big thank you uh, to the State of Change Fellows. Um, they've been supporting uh, this entire event all the, throughout the three days, and there are a couple of them on this call. Uh, it's been a hu huge um, um, uh, contribution to making this possible. Uh, so we, we are in huge debt uh, for working with them uh, and hope to do that uh, in the coming years as well. So I'll, I'll shut up now and um, I'll give the floor to Sasha, uh, who's going to kick us off um, and then we'll take it from there. Thank you, Jesper, for this, this very nice setting of the scene and, and for States of Change for all you do for us and, and for Citra for, for having us here. Um, uh, work in progress is, is a really great title when we think about um, how to spend it. And um, I, will, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what I consider one of the engine rooms of spending um, public procurement. And um, like uh, Jesper said, I, I published a report a few months ago. I'll, I'll share the link here in the chat um, on procuring um, the future. And, and really um, what we tried to do with the Chicago, Global Count, uh, Chicago Council on Global Affairs was to look at um, what is the future of city procurement as we come out of COVID and um, as we kind of enter a slightly unknown future, but kind of had a sense that more and more asks were being put on the money we spent, right? It wasn't just supposed to be spend wisely. It was also supposed to deal with all kinds of inequities. It was supposed to fix social injustices. It was supposed to repair deeply broken systems, save the environment, reduce the carbon footprint, bring, bring in the green future. Um, and be more transparent and quick and big and small all at the same time. And um, what I realized as I, as I went around um, the Zoom world and interviewed city leaders about procurement um, was really a kind of lack of vision initially. You know, no one really, everyone knew kind of what they were going to do next month but no one really had a destination. No one really had an idea of where we could go. And um, for those of you who, who don't know how big municipal procurement is, it's 10% of world GDP almost um, at $5.6 trillion this year. Um, it is big, right? And when you think about that, it doesn't include defense spending and many other kind of national um, priorities, it's really like a community fund that we can administer in different ways. Um, so, so as I was talking um, to these leaders, both in procurement and, and in mayor's offices and in civil society, um, one thing that I always started the conversation with was, was to ask, do you think that procurement serves the public or the bureaucracy? And um, you rarely get unanimous opinions, but as you can imagine, um, there was close to uh, unanimity on um, that procurement, really the way it functions today, ideally should serve society, but in practice is really designed to serve the bureaucracy and maybe by some indirect levels of abstraction, we can kind of justify a public um, focus. And, um, and, and really, they kind of started to describe um, and we started to develop a different future. And so we said, okay, so let's not talk about what we're doing next month or next year, because that's always hard to do. But let's, let's say 2030, where could we be? Bearing in mind that we want to have the SDGs accomplished. We want to have all kinds of great things happen by then, but also it's nine years. It gives us enough time to change a lot of things. And, um, and what emerged was this idea of procurement as a public service. And, and I'll try to explain a little bit what that is. So first of all, one, one way of thinking about what it means to be a public service is maybe something familiar to all of you is how we would go about or how, how we design playgrounds, how that has changed over the past years. Um, I think traditionally governments would have built public playgrounds um, anywhere they, they seemed fit, where they had a piece of land, they would order the equipment, um, contract a contractor to then build the playground um, 
for whatever budget was was the lowest cost. Nowadays, you um, you would um, in in very few places on Earth would you build a community playground without starting by talking to the children, to their families, dreaming about what kind of playground would be fun and beautiful and functional. You would look for a site that makes it incredibly prominent and accessible rather than just what land you have available. And oftentimes, um, if you work with organizations like Kaboom in the United States, um, the citizens, the families, the community would even build the playground. And, and what the government might do is prepare the ground and buy the equipment, but the assembly would be done as a community um, event in many places. And as a result, you, you don't just get better playgrounds and better play spaces, but you actually get community ownership less vandalism, really satisfied communities about their, their level of participation and your building skills around planning and so forth. Um, as we apply that to, to procurement, um, the question is, we have a system that by and large is designed to be defensive against the public. It's very difficult in many places to access information in procurement. You have to go through a lot of registration to find out what's going on, how money is spent. Um, it is full of language that no one can decipher. And in very few places, is it, is it user-centric, um, not just informing the citizen, but really involving the citizen in a similar way that we think about a playground. The reason why that playground matters is that more and more public services that, that uh, local governments provide are co-created and co-designed with citizens. I mean, that's, that's um, what is going on everywhere. And so uh, the question we ask is why not do this in, in procurement? And, and the kind of vision we try to describe is a place where procurement really is optimized to deliver that kind of playground experience across the board. And um, so we have um, looked at how do we accomplish that? And I think the, the starting point is that we couldn't really find anyone in government qualified or mandated to figure out how to manage all these trade-offs, right? When, when I have to choose between a women-owned business and a super cool technology, what am I supposed to do? Can I pay double for climate neutrality or is that a waste of taxpayers' money? Um, do we prefer local businesses and under what conditions? Um, do we wanna take risks if the potential is great and, and what might that look like? Uh, those are actually, um, in my view, societal questions. Those are not something you can politically answer easily, and certainly not someone in a procurement department can answer. And yet in a day-to-day -day practice of procurement, that's kind of what, what is going on, what we're somehow supposed to deal with. So, um, so the starting point in many ways to the future is to say we need to have a a citywide or community-wide conversation about procurement. And that of course involves people understanding what's going on and so forth. So, um, so that's in many ways the starting point. And then I think we're doing a, a few things that are quite logical um, around um, building that dream. How do we want to use our resources? How do we want to put them to work? Um, how do we shift the focus to be less concerned primarily with the damage to your bureaucracy if something goes wrong and more concerned about the bigger risk that the, the money we're spending or the service we're providing will not actually solve a problem. Um, and, and, and you can kind of work backwards from there, right? What kind of team culture do you need? Do you need people that are micromanaged with detailed workflows or people who are good at collaborating, good at thinking critically, good at saying yes and finding ways of getting that extra value for the citizens. Um, who are the suppliers we wanna work with? Do we wanna work with the same old vendors we've had for a hundred years? Um, or do we want to think about who, who in the future should we be working with and how can we put them on track to be really viable? And, and I mean, um, Dom, I'm kind of looking at you here um, with the work that FutureGov um, did and, and, you know, out of nowhere, a really credible um, new values-based partner to government emerged over a very short time that's possible everywhere um, to actually change who we're working with. Um, and, um, and I think the, the, the I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I think what we discovered was that actually a lot, is, a lot can be done 
but it really needs to be driven by a mission. And, and what we found, it's very difficult for a bureaucratic undertaking that is largely defined by its integrity. It's very difficult to have integrity when you have no clear purpose. And it's very difficult to do something constructive and positive if you only get instruction on what not to do, but few instructions on what to do, what behaviors are, are encouraged. And, and so the, the, the central question here in our conversations, and maybe the most controversial one, became around citizen participation. There are fabulous procurement practitioners I've talked to um, who said, we should not have the public involved in any of this. We are highly skilled professionals. We know what we're doing. It's complicated work. Um, the public ideally doesn't even know we exist. And, um, but the majority of people we interviewed were saying, we want more citizen participation. And they gave a number of reasons, right? Some, some would say we get better services, better outcomes, it's happening across government. But others also linked it back to risk. They said, if I'm able to involve citizens in the process, procurement becomes less risky because the choices I'm making are actually shared by many more people. And I can have an open conversation about some of the things that happen in secret right now. Um, so I, I, I wanna end on, on a kind of very short anecdote from, from Berlin where I am right now. Um, the city um, for years has been procuring a major flagship program to build um, um, more than 10 new schools and, and refurbish many more using wood construction to be carbon neutral. And uh, that contract took three years to tender. And um, then it turned out that the three construction companies who were capable of doing the work had formed a cartel and effectively doubled, um, doubled the, the, the price. And the city found itself in a pickle. Are we going to accept paying double simply to deliver the project on time? Um, or are we going to retender it, but delay the urgent need of families to have new schools? Or is it the third path, do we just compromise on climate and build schools the old way using existing contracts with, with traditional construction companies that we have on file? And, um, and I think it's, it's one of those perfect conundrums, right? Where I personally couldn't see any way out of that situation without involving the families who both are stakeholders in getting their schools and stakeholders in a carbon neutral future. So I'll, I'll, I'll hand back to you, Jesper, and I really look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha, and, and thanks for that great scene setting. Um, I'm going to quickly just hand it over to Don and Jess. Uh, so as Sasha was alluding to before, Don is the founder of FutureGov uh, and now uh, involved in an exciting new uh, initiative called uh, Institute of Impossible Ideas, which I think we'll be hearing from now. And Jess is the co-founder of that. Uh, so very excited to, to hear more about what they're up to. Uh, and how it sort of, and what sort of take it has on public spending uh, and, and relating to this conversation. So over to you. Thanks, Jessa. Um, so I'm going to kick off. I'm Jess. I'm one of the founding partners of the Institute of Impossible Ideas. Dom will introduce himself shortly. Um, I think where we fit in in this conversation is what we're going to show to you today is a work in progress possibly a new idea of, of the suppliers that fit into the, the world um, that Sasha was talking about. Um, and we'll talk about, I think I'll start out, set out why we're doing this and Dom will talk a little bit more about what it is. Um, so Dom and I, and I imagine most people on this call here have spent their careers sort of improving public services in a piecemeal way, um, both from within government and outside. I think we've had some really wonderful successes and those are mostly just moments where we've seen the incredible capacity of the public sector when public servants are just allowed to solve problems and solve problems for people and work with the communities um, and build on the strength of what's already there. But most of the time, so we got to a point where it's felt like lighting a match and, and setting it off into a damp street. Um, those sparks of modernity and progress hit budget limits, they hit legacy infrastructure, 
the risk averse culture, the bad inflexible procurement processes, um, and then sort of get to that point of the fatigue that we all feel after so much talk and attempts at change. Um, and all these things, I think it's probably now a truism to say why innovation is so hard in the public sector. Um, and the current toolkit the public servants have, and this is, has a little bit of a UK focus, but um, what we've been looking at, at at ways to improve service delivery from within, you know, there's most practices are either lopping off a part of a service to um, put into a new structure like a, a, a trust or a joint venture, um, outsourcing, of course, to the private sector or charities, creating a shared service, um, so getting a little bit of a regional economy of scale, um, or a local authority trading company to, to get a commercial model in there. And the way that these structures are used, the way that we've seen um, can create distance, they can be really useful to, to create commercial incentives, but they're rarely really 21st century organizations um, in the way that we're seeing them coming out. We see more innovative methods coming through in social programs and there's great pockets of excellence in social innovation, um, but often these are funded through social impact bonds or grants and those innovative approaches without a financially sustainable business model um, often really struggle to replicate and scale. So what we're seeing is that the current approaches aren't really giving us the quality of mainstream service that we know is possible and that we see again and again and that we've come to expect from commercial services like Airbnb, for example. There's this huge gap between what we know we can get from those services and what we, we expect from our public services. And we think it's not just because the money doesn't stack up, um, I've got here a, a snapshot of some of the services, the really important ones that we've been looking at. Um, and we see in the markets where public funds are being spent at a point of crisis, where the, the local government is at a point of crisis, there's inelastic demand because the local authority has a statutory obligation to um, spend money to, to find a placement for somebody who needs care um, and consolidated supply because the markets are highly regulated. And we're seeing these really perverse outcomes come out. Um, and this again is a bit UK focused, but six out of the 10 providers um, of children's homes in England are owned by private equity firms. Um, they're operating at profit margins at around 23%. We're seeing 19% operating profit margins for independent fostering agencies, also private equity owned. Um, four out of the five biggest residential aged care providers are highly leveraged with really complex investment structures. Um, and in temporary accommodation, providing accommodation for people who've just become homeless. Um, there's a, a billion annual spend from councils there. And none of these services are doing anything to prevent people from um, falling into crisis or reduce the demand on those services. In fact, there's actually a financial incentive for that demand to continue. Um, I put this here just because it's easy to get stuck in the economics of this, but um, the warping of the market has really tragic outcomes for us. For our communities and for our loved ones. Um, a collapsing over leveraged company means elderly residents not being cared for, not being washed for months or treated at hospital because there's a broken elevator. The residential aged care market in the UK is so stretched and over leveraged that our ability to age with dignity is, is at a real risk and it's not good enough. I'm going to throw to Dom now to talk about what our solve is for this. Hi everyone, good to see you. Um, so as you heard earlier, I was founder of FutureGov um, and left FutureGov about a year ago now to look at look at the types of problems that we've been trying to solve for 10 years from a different perspective, I guess. So as Sasha, as Sasha said, I'm you know, I'm I'm proud to say I think we helped to shape uh, a new kind of market and then create a new entry into looking at 21st century government, but very much from a I would say a sort of brownfield development type of perspective is the work that I've tended to do over my career over the last 20 years, taking what's existed, the various sedimentary layers of government that has added up over tens and hundreds of years, whether it's policy or culture or budgets, and just trying to overlay a sort of digital era around it. But the best often you can get to in that mindset, really, in my opinion, having done it for 20 years is uh, I, you know, I may look back and think I've maybe made two years of progress in 20 years that I've put effort in. Um, and, and in many ways, it may be lipstick on a pig or a website on a broken institution. But what it doesn't do is get to the roots of what could and should our organisations look like in the public sector and beyond and the social sector to, 
to, that are very purpose driven, very focused on outcomes. And obviously, Mariana Matsukato, Matsukato is is sort of the the key person to go to here when thinking about how we might think very differently. And for me, having having been part of organisations in the public sector, having set up a company that was um, sort of shareholder value driven uh, with with high purpose, but ultimately. Um, but ultimately did have shareholders in mind as well. For me, it's thinking about how can we really get to a point of, uh, of that sort of first principles of the vision of what uh, 21st century public organisations could look like. Because as, as Jess was saying, we're seeing that in other sectors and having, having led on the sort of redevelopment of our institutions versus the private sector, I would say, particularly in places like the UK where, where certain services are world-class, we fall behind when it comes to sort of startup, startup government. So where we want to go with this in terms of the Institute of Impossible Ideas, I guess as much as a douchebag as he is, Elon Musk has definitely uh, hit on to something in our opinion around what does rebooted government look like what does it look like to actually say okay let's let's bring forward the benefits of government the democratic mandate the sort of custodian of our collective aspirations as, as Sasha was alluding to around you know we have this vast budget which should then be spent as an expression of our collective will in order to improve our own and our and our society's lives um, but on top of that the actual delivery vehicles to get to that ends should be far more open than it is right now. It's either sort of corporatized through bureaucratic capture or it's corporatized through private sector capture. Uh, and often when we talk about entrepreneurial in government, entrepreneurialism in government, we're talking about uh, corporate or commercial interests, um, not truly about imagination and new ways of working and business models. Um, so what we were seeing from SpaceX was how can we reboot from first principles, you know, the way that they did uh, to save NASA 80% on their uh, service, which is to deliver to space stations um, using very modern technologies and approaches, but without the sort of endless privatization to people like Musk uh, of our public services. So this is where we've got to really with, and, and it's, it's great to be able to talk about this because it's very much a work in progress. Uh, we're in sort of that liminal space of pre-launch at the moment. So uh interested in ideas and uh offers of support at this stage as we move into the next stage of of setup but crucial to us around the institute is this time around it's about setting up a community interest company um so a locked in social enterprise at the center which means that it has a very strong purpose and uh and sort of uh self-fulfillment at the center of it uh, whilst at the same time using that as a sort of venture studio, a venture company that allows us to invent uh, and focus strongly on impact, um, which allows us to think about different models for ventures based on different public problems that we're looking to focus on, creating this sort of imagination space outside of the gravitational pull of um, procurement and bureaucracy in the first instance, at least before reality hits as we start to deliver and scale ventures in different uh, policy areas. And so the types of principles behind the Institute, um, as I say, is less about hacking up bureaucracy, but rebooting bureaucracy and rebooting public service delivery. So thinking about what would you do in, in 2021, 2022, if you were starting from scratch with government rather than having to work within the bounds of everything that we bring with us. Uh, really importantly for us is significant savings as well. Uh, when you hear that uh, SpaceX can drive out such huge savings for NASA for them to redirect that funding into other projects, we should be able to do that for our city governments and others as well in almost everything that we do. If you think about the inefficiencies of using certain technology in your everyday life, the policy, the politics that overhangs everything, this is entirely feasible. We just haven't had the space in order to think truly differently about these things. Uh, and there's people who believe in this. So 11 local authorities in the UK, almost 10% of the local government sector, supported the sort of discovery and design process to get us to this stage uh, as a means of creating a sort of collaborative invention space for different types of public services. And the sort of areas that we've prototyped so far, we believe the sort of process is applicable to anything. 
uh, really key is things is that sort of community and social lock into these uh, these ventures, um, but also a way to uh, imagine and do very differently. But the areas that we've looked at so far are things like um, social housing, foster care, and uh, care for older adults as well. Um, and the interesting thing for us is that a lot of these spaces are spaces where they've either been privatized, outsourced, or you do see new entrants from places like Silicon Valley under funds like Anderson Horowitz, where they're starting to see the opportunity in these spaces. Uh, and it's almost like venture and public service creation rather than necessarily privatization or outsourcing. It's almost creating parallel government. Um, so for us, we want to help our colleagues and work with our colleagues in government to actually get ahead of that game so that there is all of that benefit of social and public uh, democratic mandate and legitimacy and other things baked into these things before uh, before the private sector runs hot and ahead of uh, where, where we're able to get to within public services themselves. And the way, the way that we're looking at this is sort of standing on the shoulders of things like internal business cases for Investor Save, which I've spent an awful lot of my career writing and looking at, but equally external sources like social impact bonds, where external social capital has been used to leverage reinvention and rethinking of our public services. So for us, really, it's, you know, one way of looking at it might be this sort of externally oriented Investor Save program through ventures. Um, that actually uh, help reboot government uh, in and of itself uh, with much better outcomes at much lower cost. Um, yeah, so I mean, just so we don't sound like Weshmik and we have it all figured out, um, just a couple of things that we have noticed through our initial conversations that we've, we're, we're not going to find particularly easy. Um, we're already kind of trying to, trying to think of solutions for um, in a lot of our conversations um, with potential local authority partners. There's this, no matter how many times we say partnership co-design, people-centered, we actually put it sort of three or four times throughout the slides and come back to it. There is in the forefront of everyone's imaginations, consulting, outsourcing and privatization. Um, and the response to that is on us. We really need to shift that mindset in the way that we communicate. But it's definitely something we're, we're thinking about and struggling with at the moment. Um, there's also the issue of a full stack. I think probably a lot of you are thinking at the moment we've bitten off a, a huge piece of, of the problem. Um, and, uh, you know, the issue is that we can't just pick small parts of the system and hone them um, in the way that you, you know, the small business handbook says to do. Um, for this model to work, we really need to rethink sizable services and achieve sizable savings and improvements. And although it promises a huge impact, there's also a challenge with that as well. Um, so I'm just going to put up here, I'll run through them really quickly because I don't want to take too much more of your time. Um, we've got a slide on all of our working assumptions at the moment. Um, I think we've sort of covered the, the top level one um, so far in terms of what, describing what we're trying to do, but the whole premise of what we're doing sits on this idea that we can create these organisations that can discover, design and deliver um, better, cheaper services than current models. And then just focusing on the money, we think the savings from these better services should be invested in prevention and services of the future. So that's where the money flow comes in and that diagram Don was talking about before. Um, and then finally, where's the money coming from now? Um, we think that the investor save model plus philanthropy to, to go into the backing of the Institute will give us the current funds and the flexibility that we need to do what we need to do. Um, and we'll share the slides after this so we can get down a little bit deeper into the rest of the um, assumptions in our, in our conversations after this. That would be fantastic. And so just to finish with a, a call to action, I suppose, we really think that, that now seems like the best possible time to be doing what we're doing. Um, we have great faith in public sector entrepreneurs that, that are already out there and frontline workers that are already working on these problems. It's just about bringing people together. And the technology that we're talking about, it's not the cutting edge. It's like Dom says, you know, that there are there are small improvements that that can be made, um, you know, that will look like big improvements on what's currently there in, in the services that we're talking about. Um, and we really, really do want to do this together. Um, so please get in touch. Thanks, Jess and Dom, uh, for sharing that extremely ambitious initiative. Um, uh, very exciting and very encouraging uh, that you're taking this on. Um, I'm going to quickly 
invite Jacob in to speak as well. Uh, I'm mindful of, of time, so, so we'll run maybe a little bit past the hour if that's okay with this group, um, just to have room for some conversation. Um, I'm also going to encourage uh, the group to start asking questions in the chat so we can uh, link them into the conversation as we go along, if you have any. So please don't hesitate to do that. Uh, so Jacob, over to you. Um, you obviously, um, well, we are old colleagues from MindLab working, trying to innovate from within government. Uh, now you are working with the Bikupen Foundation in Denmark and trying to, in many respects, experiment with new kinds of investment, in, in particularly in the, in the um, areas of social policy. Uh, so um, so really keen to hear from you and, and your experiences. Thanks, uh, Jesper. Uh, yeah, so for today, I uh, look back not only in, uh, on my experiences from the Beacon Foundation, but also from my time in MindLab and uh, gave some thoughts on what I've learned over the years on how public servants uh, think about spending money. Uh, and that's what I'm going to share uh, three examples of uh, today. Um, the first of the three examples is actually quite old. I think it's six or seven years old. It was a thing we did uh, together yesterday back in the MindLab days, where Danish government gave a lot of thought on how we could nurture innovation in procurement, uh, not with social impact bonds, but uh, simply in the way we uh, made tenders available for private companies. Uh, and uh, the, the big thing there was uh, what was called outcome-based procurement. Uh, that was basically about not uh, making a tender on buying new activities or products, but uh, making a tender that stated that we wanted to buy a certain outcome. And then it was actually up to the bidder to decide how to uh, create that outcome in practice. And the very famous example that the Danish uh, agencies uh, put forward on what was this about was grass. So basically uh, they said that uh, now uh, uh, public bodies, you should not uh, make a tender asking uh, how many times a week that the grass should be cut, but you should instead make a tender saying uh, how high is the maximum height of the grass. And then it is up to the bidder to uh, decide how to achieve that in the smartest way. And uh, that was quite easy to understand that case. And uh, then me and some colleagues, we uh, went on a tour uh, interviewing procurement officers on uh, what uh, it would uh, require for them to use this approach when making the next uh, tender. And uh, we particularly focused on the healthcare because uh, Denmark is quite big on health tech. So we wanted to uh, explore whether uh, this new way of procuring could uh, support uh, the private companies in new innovative solutions in the health tech uh, field. And uh, very quickly, uh, it turned out that uh, this grass example did not really apply when it was complex environments as hospitals. So just to give you an example, uh, a bit, we tried to make an experiment. So what would it be like to make a tender that would not require people to sell you bets, but instead sell you the purpose or the outcome that a bet supports? And very quickly, we found out that this is actually quite difficult to, to state uh, for users and innovators like us in MindLab. Uh, we thought of it as a great uh, challenge to find out what role does a bet really play in a hospital? But for a procurement officer, this is a pretty hard question because uh, a bid serves a lot of different functions. Just a bid itself is a means of transportation. As you can say, it's a means for lying down. It's a place to rest, uh, a place to equip uh, medicine and so on and so forth. Uh, and on top of that, uh, when you talk about outcomes and not artifacts, then the next question would be then, what is it actually the tender is about? Is it only the outcome that the bid in itself provides or is it the bid in context with all the other stuff that's going on in the hospital? And then all of a sudden you come to this uh, issue that Jess, you also pointed to that full stack solutions are quite hard because we, we work in a very complex environment. Uh, and, and because of this, they just said, okay, well, Jakob, uh, this is way too difficult for me. I just go about and buy some more bits because I don't have time for this very complex research on what is the outcomes and functions of all the different artifacts in a complex setting. 
So this was the first very big barrier uh, that defining artifacts and activities as outcomes uh, is quite tricky for procurement officers and actually for most people. That's why we spend so much time on doing user-centered and design-led innovation processes. But apart from that, the second very big obstacle was that uh, comparing two very qualitatively different ways of achieving an outcome was considered uh, like comparing apples and oranges for them. And one could say that, well, does it matter as long as you choose uh, a solution that will serve the purpose, so to speak? Well, for the procurement officers, this question was actually quite crucial because uh, basically they are uh, responsible for arguing why bidder one, one over bidder two, three, and four. And we see uh, from the point of view as the procurement officers, a lot of delays uh, in a project uh, plans due to complaints for the people who did not get the bid. And then there is the whole bid have to go, go uh, over and again. So this was the second very big barrier for the procurement officers to use uh, this way of uh, procuring. Uh, I still do today uh, think there must be a lot of potential in procuring uh, outcomes instead of art artifacts and activities, but uh, we need to find ways to handle those difficulties uh, that is faced by procurement officers. So this is uh, one of the points. Uh, the second is uh, in the foundation and also in MindLab, we have worked a lot with trying to uh, think about how to activate civil society resources in public solutions. And most of you on this call have probably been on the same, uh, same agenda. But still today we see that uh, in many cases it's good in the experimental setting, but it's, it's, it's pretty tricky to make, to, do main, to make it mainstream. And an anecdote that really shows uh, why this is difficult point of view against civil servants is a uh, presentation I did a couple of years ago for uh, CFOs in municipalities, where I shared uh, this particular case for them. Uh, it's a case from Denmark, where the municipality of Copenhagen has agreed that we wanna have 100,000 new trees in the municipality. And as you can probably guess, that is uh, pretty expensive, uh, not buying the trees, but to plant them and to maintain them. And because of that, uh, the municipality has came up with this, I think, really great idea that uh, if you have some private ground, as is the case right here, the grass you can see here, that is visible from public space over here on the uh, pavement, uh, then you can actually get trees for free from the municipality, and then it's up to you to plant them and maintain them. And I presented this as a case of, see, this is a great example of if we think about civil resources, then we can save a ton of money. And there was this guy raising in Santa said, yeah, but I, this I can't go through, but because there is a chance that uh, you ask for a tree and then you sell it on eBay. And then it's public money who is like wasted uh, with fraud. Uh, and at the first, I laughed a bit about it because the, the risk of fraud, it costs zero to nothing compared to what is uh, saved by thinking differently on planting and maintaining trees. But there is a thing here about uh, how do we think about fraud and, and, and is it okay that some money is spent in the way that is not intended to uh, by civil servants uh, compared to what you can actually uh, save. So there is a, a, a dilemma here that you should certainly think more about when trying to think about how public money is spent. Third example I want to share is both the foundation I'm in now and the foundation I was in before, the Rockwell Foundation. We have really tried to think about how we as foundations can uh, leverage this potential in social impact bonds. And what I find quite interesting here is that the two foundations have worked quite differently on how to support that. So Rockwell Foundation is a very evidence-driven foundation and uh, their approach is basically to take uh, particular approaches to solving complex pro public problems and then make really uh, hard evidence, uh, randomized control, trial, control trials that uh, investors can then use to de-risk 
or at least to judge whether an investment is uh, will pay off in the final end or not. So basically provide evidence for investors so that they can judge is this a good investment or not. The B Coupon Foundation I work in now has taken a quite similar, a different approach that I find quite interesting. So instead of providing hard evidence, uh, instead we have said to a, we've made a case where we can say to a private investor, say, okay, we know that the proof is not there yet. We don't have very hard evidence that particular approaches will actually work to solve complex problems. So because of that, we as a foundation, we are in the homeless area. Uh, we will cap the first 20% of the, of the potential loss, you will guess, you will get in case uh, the business uh, turns out negatively. Uh, so the investor has provided uh, 2 million euros to make a homeless shelter, uh, turn that into permanent housing for youngsters. They believe that they will get their money back, uh, but because we said, okay, if in case this do not turn out a positive business case, then we'll cap the, the first 20%. And that made them want to make this first case for an investment. And we hope to make similar uh, cases from the BCOOM Foundation side to attract more investors into to making these, uh, these cases. So these just by three uh, examples from uh, both Bikuben and also from my former work, uh, where I think we we learned something about how public uh, bodies think about uh, spending their money. Thanks, Jakob. Uh, thanks for sharing that and a, and a great uh, trip down memory lane to some extent. Um, and I guess, uh, but also a little bit. Um, depressing uh, insofar as uh, many of these challenges are still very much in the forefront uh, of where we are. So um, this morning we talked about the fact that 20 years ago they said that new public management was on its way out and uh, we're still having that conversation as well. So so, um, so how, you know, so I guess, uh, I mean, maybe to pick up the, the last point, uh, you, were, you were sort of talking about these deficit guarantees uh, and, and a way of de-risking public investment or investments or more generally, I guess, in, in that case. Um, uh, just because I had this conversation sort of with Sasha earlier, uh, I'd like to invite you in for a bit of a comment on that, Sasha, on that example specifically. Uh, and with a view, maybe as a more general question for the panel here about what is the role uh, that, um, well, key organizations, whether they're public or private or foundations or philanthropic, need to be taking um, when, when de-risking uh, investments. Um, is there a role there, Sasha? And um, what role is there to play? Uh, and, and I guess what are the risks of de-risking uh, is a question as well. Yes, uh, thank you for, for sharing this. Um, I mean, in, in in all my work, where we've 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 worked with so many governments on running procurements that were very very open and agnostic, the question of risk always came up very very early, and I think the you know the the starting point here is really to say if procurement really is to so, supposed to serve the public, the first risk that comes to mind must be whether we are actually solving problems, whether we are actually delivering good services. And, um, you know, homelessness is a good example, maybe to pick that up, because, you know, homelessness, we know, and there are now 14 cities in the US that have um, functional zero homelessness, and um, through good management. And so I think the idea that we're sustaining this apparatus to treat the symptom of homelessness rather than eradicate homelessness as a goal is a very good reflection on how procurement is done, right? We keep buying more shelters, we keep buying more services to treat homelessness, but no one really says, well, when we run procurements, we should default for solving the problem rather than treating it. And of course, solving entails certain risks, right? In, in terms of you're, you're going to try to solve the problem, maybe you can't solve it, or maybe it's difficult. Um, but I really don't think that it's the job of anyone else but government 
to take ownership of solving problems. But the challenge is right now, no one is giving the government that sort of mandate when it comes to spending, or the government has a self-assumed mandate. And I think that's where we, we really are suggesting that government should go out, should involve citizens, and whether that's through kind of public deliberation processes or otherwise, to really give the government a mandate on what to do with the spending and how ambitious to be. And I think the risk is only defined backwards from there. You cannot start by saying the risk is that we're losing a tree if we're battling um, climate neutrality. Um, and, and so that's, first of all, I think the, the big misconception in government is to pass risk onto the private sector. First of all, that never works. Secondly, the amounts, especially if you take like an impact bond, they're never big enough to really move the needle on government risk. They're, they're tokens of risk and they're very complex to engineer. Um, so I think we have money enough, we have resources enough. Um, what we're really lacking is purpose and, and that purpose needs to be public. It cannot be somewhat implicit in the bureaucracy. It needs to be stated and articulated. Yes, Tom, do you have anything to reflections to add here on that question? Uh, am I allowed to say no? Yeah, you are. I mean, like, speaking after the expert on it, it's pretty tricky to be honest. So I'll leave that one to Sasha. Oh, I, can, I can maybe chip in. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, Yes, but so I totally agree, uh, Sasha. On uh, purpose should come first, and that should uh, uh, the ownership should lie with the uh, with the government and public institutions. Uh, no doubt about that. And uh, for this particular case, actually, also we started with making a lot of advocacy on exactly the change from fixing uh, uh, providing shelters to uh, end homelessness. But having said that, even when the politicians, they actually agreed, well, now the municipality of Aarhus, as it is, we want to end homelessness. Then because the bureaucracy still works in with, with rules that do not really comply with that yet, then we saw this as a nice way of hacking uh, the different, the existing bureaucratic way of procuring uh, so, so, so that we were able to comply with the new vision from the politicians. But I very much agree that the vision should should always come first. So I just wanted to follow up on, on that and sort of relating to um, an earlier point that, that I think all of you kind of touched upon in, in different ways. You talk about sort of this problem of lack of vision, uh, Sasha, uh, I believe, yes, uh, or was it done kind of talking about, um, uh, you know, that need for for bringing in the the, the 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 voice of the of the real people, so to speak, and, and build from from there. Um, uh, in the in the, this morning, we were we were talking about the relationship between politics and bureaucracy in, in that regard, and uh, and how in, I mean how on the one hand we need you know uh, bureaucratic missions that are visionary. Uh, but on the other hand, we need to uh, kind of follow the political winds where visions, if there are any at all, uh, are random and slightly kind of maybe subject to um, whatever is the topic of the day, so to, so to speak. Um, so I'm wondering, and, and I don't know if you've thought about this in relating to the institute uh, that you are starting, uh, Jess and Don, um, how, I mean, what way do we work with, the, with that dynamic or the lack of that dynamic? Um, you know, um, what level of government, what kinds of politicians, if any, that sort of thing. Um, be curious. Um, yeah, I think we've thought about it a, a bit. Um, one of the sort of working assumptions that we have around the Institute is we're sort of creating this venture company that spits out these, these ventures that are doing something very practical um, to you know, reimagine public services. But the Institute itself sort of sitting around that as a body that we think is will be well placed to kind of create an enabling environment for those ventures. Um, so, I mean, we could have just said, okay, we're going to create a great 21st century fostering agency and then see if we can kind of work from doing the small thing first and expand and scale that. Um, but we think that, you know, the reality of improving public services and what we've seen happen again and again with some small piecemeal projects is that if you don't have that force of 
um, you know, thought leadership, but as well as like good relationships um, and solid enablement at every level of politics. You know, like I said, those matches that you light are going to fall on a damp street and, and not take off. Um, so it's something we thought a lot about and how do we provide kind of the structure around and the stability around what we're doing, which is really important sort of demonstration that things can be better on the ground um, while kind of clearing, I guess, the way in front of it with all levels of politics as well. Yeah. Great. I mean, one thing I would just add to that as well is that one of the challenges that we recognise is that through my career, I've spent more time being told what vehicles and what, you know, general principle and ideology that a local authority or a bit of government wants to follow rather than actually the outcome they're trying to achieve than I'd care to admit. So the amount of times I've been called in by a chief executive of the city government to say, I need a social enterprise. And you say, what exactly why? And they're like, well, my neighbor's just got one. So we need one or a local authority trading company. Uh, and I'm like, uh, remind me the problem we're trying to solve again. Uh, and so for me, like, or you say we're an outsourcing council or we're an insourcing council is the current trend in, in the more left-leaning bits of local government in the UK, for instance, but neither of those is right. I mean, like, you know, it's a very, I've probably just reached that point in my career 20 years in where, like, I want sort of radical pragmatism, really, which is, you know, whatever, whatever the right vehicle is to achieve a radical outcome is what I want to get people behind really um rather than it being vehicle first or governance first or whatever it might be which has tended to be where the politics and managerialism has gone over time um it's almost take the best of all of the pick and mix that we've had over the last 30 years add to it with some more new ways of working and thinking and then work and then just put it to one side and focus steadfastly on outcomes really good just maybe just a quick follow-up from simon in the chat um why do you think local authorities can't focus around outcomes, provide these services themselves? Um, I've sort of maybe answered that a little bit. Was there anything more to add on that question? No, I just, I mean, from my point of view, like we've, uh, you know, I've probably done 15 innovation labs in inverted commas, which ended up became productized and whatever else. But if I look back over time, like they're business improvement spaces, really, because they, uh, they never uh, exist outside the realms of immediate reality. They only ever exist in the thought process. You, you, you co-design with practitioners and those practitioners are always thinking, what will Dave, the head of housing, think about this? Whatever you like to pretend otherwise. And so for me, it's not that people aren't capable. It isn't that they don't have that imagination or desire. It's just that we don't have the structures uh, to get beyond that gravitational pull of, you know, will this add up? Will I be able to persuade my boss, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so for me, it's that holds us back from thinking about outcomes because the outcome that's always first and foremost in people's mind is mm. yeah, what will the powers that be think of this rather than is this the right answer for people? Yeah. That totally echoes uh, down the, the experience in, the, in Denmark. And what was actually quite interesting is that the, when COVID was just really taking off, off in, uh, in Denmark, uh, the Bikum Foundation, we um, funded a... Uh, real life uh, survey uh, where we had a lot of qualitative interviews with top civil servants in the municipalities in Denmark uh, where they reflected on how they did crisis management and what was very very clear finding was that uh, what they really liked about COVID was that and also that was not only for top management but the entire organization that people for once uh, were allowed not to think about process at all so the only uh, target was outcome. Uh, and that was just kind of, it was not stated like explicitly, it was just the feeling that was inside these municipalities and that enabled them to do things that they would never have done before because all of a sudden it was okay to skip process. Yeah. And I, I, I wanted to add something and um, I'm, I'm working on an, an upcoming report on um, how cities adopted some really transformative um, innovations um, over the past decades. And I think one of the really important things here is to, to underline how long transformative change takes. And I think there is a mi misconception often that we're changing a system by running a three-year project. And, and the truth is that cannot be done and will not be done and has never been done. 
and it certainly won't be done by some kind of big disruptive idea because um, local governments deal with services that that um, are deeply embedded and related to people's complex needs and and behaviors and so i think the 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 kind of continuing finding we had was that those who succeeded and, and we're talking really about transformative change those who succeeded were people and 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 developments that were deeply embedded in the community and built very very deep and empowered um, citizens or or um, stakeholders as actual leaders of the change so actually the transformation was sustained at some point by the people um, whose problem was being solved rather than by an institution and the institutions kind of became the enablers of that change and and began to change the way they were contracting began to change the way they were regulating laws they were passing and um and i think this is really central um that transformative change really usually happens when there's a shift in power and in power dynamics and um and we're talking here about problems right like homelessness that are not about building a better shelter um, they are about um, empowering people to take charge of their lives in, in terms of having the right support system around them. It's not that people choose to be homeless. And I think that's a kind of really important perspective to bear in mind. It's something procurement cannot answer, for example, um, but it's something where procurement right now is doing more to distance us from empowering people. It's, it's a contributing factor to the distance rather than actually becoming one of the bridges um, by, by building that connection. So I think to, for me, what I take away from this and also listening to Dom, I'm, I'm thinking we need, um, we need this bold ideas and bold experimentation, but it usually emerges out of practice. And that practice is based in, in real community, not in, not in the abstract. And that's where for me, the analogy with, with Elon Musk or Mazukatu ends. Um, and, and I think that's where, where municipal practitioners have real capabilities that we can build on that are entirely unique to the way we're running government. Just nodding, uh, Sasha. Um, so I am mindful of time, uh, but I did want to maybe just, uh, just get one and a half question in before we end. Is that all right with all of you? Great, because uh, there was a chest question in, in the chat from, from Cindy um, uh, that I'll, call on in a second, Cindy, if that's okay with you. Um, uh, because you, you, earlier, many, both, well, several of you kind of talking about the need, both in terms of your initiative, Dom, Jess, around the, the space for imagination. Um, and Sasha, you talked about uh, the need for investing in entrepreneurialism, not the private sector kind, but the, 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 the yeah, the, the need that the work that actually goes on to Get in new ideas and actually follow through on them uh, inside of government. Um, uh, and in both cases, there is a challenge of, of how to actually properly invest in that. And obviously, uh, Jess and Dom, you are giving parts of the answer to what that could look like. But Cindy, you had a question around how to invest in public sector innovation, which I hope is sort of in doing justice uh, in, in saying that there is a parallel there. Do you want to expand on that question? I'm still on the call. I've checked. Sorry. Yeah, Cindy? Yes, Heidi. Um, my, my question really was around, um, are there already examples, case studies of arguments and um, I guess proof in a way um, of how um, investors of, of, of all walks really uh, types of investors can be um, attracted to to invest in, in the, the different avenues that uh, the public sector has for supporting growth. I mean, it should be really attractive because public sectors is huge. There are billions um, spent on public sector, uh, yet um, from the numbers I've seen, it, it just isn't. They shy away from they issue it uh, tremendously. So that, I would just wonder if there, there are case studies or examples or, or arguments for 
that that uh, that that show um, how how investment can be attracted to. Thanks, Cindy. Um, any reflection on that one? Big question. I mean, the, uh, just a couple of quick things. I, I I definitely don't have the answer for that, and I think that's probably the majority of our journey over the next year or more. Um, I guess I'm lucky in the fact that I've always been interested in financial innovation within government, so that which I think is closely related to procurement innovation as well, which just makes me a massive nerd. But um, but I do think that when you think about the vast sums of money in pension pots, for instance, or in uh, treasury management schemes within city government, uh, there is a huge holding of uh, financial opportunity within the boundaries of particularly city government already. Um, the, the, answer, the answer on that side is always willingness um, and risk appetite. So I spoke to a local authority recently that the political uh, side of the organization had set their, set their risk limit at only 3% of all investment could be put into high risk investments within that local authority. 3%. Um, so uh, so that many of these things would probably be seen in that space. So I think a lot of it is a political question rather than a sort of, you know, financial ability or, or, or weight question. And then on the other side, I would say that returning to living in the US in the last six months uh, and speaking to investors here, it is fascinating to see now that many major philanthropy and private investment firms have started seeing government as a meaningful uh, vertical within their portfolio. When I tried to fundraise within FutureGov six or seven years ago, it was always seen as a sort of philanthropic, they're there, you know, maybe we'll feel, you know, this is something worthy that we can put a tiny bit of side cash into, whereas now it is seen as a mature, I mean, the answer often is healthcare, sadly, because that's seen as the major growth area, obviously. Um, so it's hard outside of that. But nevertheless, there's a maturing, I think, of and a perspective on government, which is it's not just hell on earth to engage with government. It is possible to make a good return for good social outcomes, particularly when you take a slow money perspective, this new term that has emerged in private investing. And if people are thinking more a 10 to 20 year timeline rather than a three year grow and exit, which has tended to be the um, perspective previously. So I'm 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 hopeful. Uh, and the pandemic has created uh, an availability of cash like uh, never before as well, weirdly, um, which I think will which I think will be flooded into these these investment areas. Can I maybe build on on what Dom just said? So this is something we've been really interested in in how uh, the US, uh, the UK, and other countries compare when it comes to. Um, how innovation is is adopted by by governments, and for example, in the U.S., we found that there is a twenty to one ratio of unvalidated venture capital backed technologies getting adopted by government compared to proven social innovations, and um, and in the U.K., it's actually pretty much one to one. Um, you actually have a one-to-one -one adoption of technological innovation compared to social innovations, which in my view is a more desirable state. And I think when you, when you hear investors, especially in the US, but also elsewhere, talk about government, they talk about government as a specific type of customer. So um, venture capitalists see it as a sticky buyer of technology who will keep subscribing and is too lazy or incapable of leaving when something is no longer the best in class. And I think we, we have to think about the public sector also and how we present the public sector as a, what kind of customer do we want to represent? What kind of invitation are we extending to investors? What should they think about when they see us? Because I think we run the risk that we become, um, we create this kind of cynical perception that government is just a really weird buyer, but you can in, in, in not as many words, you can kind of somewhat screw them over. And, and once you sell to them, that's okay. And that's been the traction of many companies that have been selling technology to governments in, in the US has been really aggressive scaling of sales tactics and delivering practically zero impact on, on public service outcomes. And I think that is something where we have to all be careful as we're thinking about leveraging that, that market and investment dynamic.
I could maybe pick up on some of the stuff that uh, Dominic said regarding that question. Uh, so I think uh, looking ahead, I think it's also very important to think about the exact um, roles and responsibilities that uh, public uh, organizations and private companies should take in co-developing these new solutions. Uh, and for example, in New Zealand, they have a quite interesting uh, program where promising tech, uh, gov tech companies, they can enter a incubator where they do not only get uh, process support, but they are actually allowed to get public servants on their team uh, so that they will be able to have access to both uh, knowledge about the internal logics of the public uh, bodies and also obviously the, the network to a lot of uh, colleagues within uh, the public sector. And I think this is a quite nice example of, it's not about buying and uh, supplying, but it's about co-creating uh, new solutions. And, and that's also some of the stuff that you're doing, Dom, I'm really looking forward to how you think about that question on the division of labor and role between uh, the, the different parties. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, everyone, uh, for the questions. Um, I, uh, I want to end uh, by asking uh, Sasha, um, since you are, have just done a report on the topic. Uh, so based on this conversation, what's the chapter that you forgot to write in that report? Uh, or, the, or the chapter you, you are not allowed to write, maybe? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a great um, question. Um, I think co-creation um, of social imagination is what I would call it. And, uh, you know, I was writing this for a global audience, which meant that governments were, are in very different places around the world um, when it comes to procurement. Um, I think social imagination is incredibly important. And again, I'm not talking about the dreaming of techno evangelists, but I'm talking about really um, using our resources um, to meet meet our communities and engage them in, in an informed, informed way around what the future can hold. And I think in the best case scenario, we can use public funding as a, um, as a shared watering hole um, to create the futures we desire, right? In a much more, much more open way and, and allow new people to play roles. And, and we kind of think less about risk or who gets what and more about what, uh, what is the journey we're taking. Um, and I think there are glimpses of that future, but that's certainly something we couldn't get into. And I, I love the, the Institute of Impossible Ideas in that sense, you know, as a kind of one of the possible vehicles um, that we can create to do that future. And, and there are many others um, that I think we need, to, we need to prototype to do that. So, and much of this is underway, but I think, you know, we now need to start to put money into it or open the tap, right? The money is there, but begin to kind of change the flow of money um, rather than just saying innovators have to endlessly prove that they're saving money before we can um, do anything else. Because the reality is the status quo is just really unsuccessful. And we somehow never talk about that as a, as a cost. Well, that's a very uh, fitting sentence to end on, I think. Um, I did take away that this um, this sort of circles on my notes defining risk. Who defines it, and with what logical epistemology? I, I, I think um, um, I want to thank the entire panel here for sharing their work in progress, uh, whether that was thoughts, projects, or formal projects. Um, in a way, I'll, I'll, these are all unfinished thoughts and. Um, and it was great to just hear from, from all of your experiences. So, so thank you so much for, for taking part. Uh, thank you to the people who showed up and uh, for all the questions and engagement. Um, the, the, the learning journey continues. We'll have a few more sessions today for the, for the very ambitious people of you. Uh, one uh, just in a moment, I think, on action learning. Uh, and then one tonight around the future of the, well, the future profile of, of Public servants, so very, very timely, I think. Uh, so, a big panel will be reflecting on that. So, um, so much more to come, and uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully, seeing some of you 
soon and uh, otherwise have a great day or morning or evening wherever you are and uh, yeah take care